Um, my topic is scattering theory three, and what I will talk about mainly are correlations functions and their role in nutrient scattering. Um, so I will introduce what is our correlation functions and how they look like, how, uh, what they tell. And then I will talk a bit about the Van Hove correlation function, which is a, the great generalization um, for correlations functions in materials. Um, then how this relates to scattering functions. Um, there we see why we need this for nutrient scattering experiments and then and then the intermediate uh, scattering function is just a third function which is also related and some applications to nutrient experiments so correlation functions uh, describe the um, describe describe the relationship between um, one or more physically quality, uh, quantities and their variation in time and or space. So the simplest case would be an autocorrelation function and uh, here in the, on the graph on the left, you see some data which is apparently well, quite random, but um, if you look at the correlation function, you can actually get some information out of these. So the correlation function looks like this. We have um, the, the trace over, um, over an operator with itself. And in this case, we have two times the same um, uh, quantity, which is, which is A in this case. Um, whatever physical quantity and we measure it at different times so here is the timeline of, of this this quantity and then for each combination of times we can um, we can actually count like the difference between the the two um, like this, this one quantity and and plot this function over over the different over the time. Um, what we see here, for example, it starts at a squared. So we have a the the operator comes in twice um, by a product. So it's it's no wondering that at time zero um, the quantity will always be the same as itself. So this is basically um, the average of the square of the of the um, of this quantity over time. And it converges um, towards infinity to the um, to, to the square of the average, of course. So what can we read out here is basically how fast it, it converges and and well this one is mainly featureless but as we can see there is or as we will see later there is also correlation functions here um contain more information about this which are not so um random let's see then another very common correlation function is the pair distribution function, um, which correlates the position of, of different um, particles in space. So our quantity, which is correlated here, is the is the density or the position of the particle, say. But um, the operator, with, which we use, is the is is the particle density operator, and um, as the the function is worded is the probability of finding a particle at the position R if there is simultaneously a particle at the position zero. So once we put here 
in some position r and once we put in zero and what we get out is, is this function um, and we can actually see a distribution of particles of, of the distances between the particles which gives us some information um, the generalis generalization of these cases um, was done by Leon van Hove. Um, he introduced this this function, which relates the the probability of of finding a particle to another particle in space and in time. So we introduced time dependent um, density operator. Uh, which is given, sorry, I, I didn't explain earlier, this is the, uh, the Dirac delta function, of course, we see every scattering center as a um, point like particle, and it has a position rj, the particle j, and of course this part, uh, this function will be zero um, everywhere else than rj. Um, then we can plug this in here and we arrive at the function which relates every particle um, position to every other particle position at every point in time. So why do we need this, this function? Um, and so the, the reason is it relates to the scattering function, which we have already introduced. Um, so if we look closely, um, this function has a, a similar structure here. It relates, relates to um, two states actually in the case of the scattering function. Um, but um, what is the big difference to this func uh, in this function? We don't have space and time, but we have the Q vector and omega. And this gives us already a hint on how the, the scattering function is related to um, the, the Van Hove correlation function, which is by the Fourier transform. And so we can go through this um, shortly. So if we start with the for the Panhova function, and uh, we can actually plug in the the Fourier transform form of the of the delta function and put this in above here. Um, then we can integrate out the um, over R and we arrive at this expression. You can look up uh, the, the full der derivation in the document by Helmut Schrova, which you can find online by just typing this in Google. It's very nice. Um, it contains a lot of information about uh, neutron scattering. It's available of open access. And then if we compare, compare this to, the, to our scattering function, we can see that it actually relate, is related here by this relation. So essentially this means that if we fully transform in time and in space, this um, scattering, uh, it is an holy correlation function, then we can measure, measure the scattering function. So, um, so what does what this tell us? Why, why do we need the, uh, the any uh, correlation function. If 
So this tell, tells us if we are able to compute um, the, um, the correlation function, um, which implies that we have a model for how our, our our sample looks like, or what is the microscopic structure or dynamics of our model, of our, our sample, then we can uh, compute this function and fully transform it into the uh, into the scattering function and, and compare it to our data. Of course, there is um, no way to directly measure this function since we um, since it's microscopic and, and usually an ensemble of many many particles. Um, but in this indirect way, we we can do it. Um, yes. So an example would be here, for example, uh, if we have a um, diffraction experiment. Of course, we don't, as um, Henry said before, we are looking at uh, an, an integral of all um, all wavelengths. So uh, not only the elastic case, but also um, or only in elastic scattering events. Um, and then, so K here should be Q. Um, so we get this structure factor um, only uh, in, in the static approximation, or in, in the static average of our own energies. And, and from this diffraction data, which is plotted on on the left for for silica, okay, actually we can calculate the pH distribution function. So one can immediately see the difference between crystalline silica in this case and, and glassy silica. One has much much um, better better defined features here, and this reflects in the pH distribution function to a far higher order, which means we have all of these, these oscillations um, here and every peak, let's say, corresponds to a, to a distance between two scattering centers that occurs often within a sample, which is um, very easy to imagine in a crystal because we have a re repeated distance in a lattice and and as, as you can imagine, then, then also the distance between two atoms will, some will occur more often than others. If we have um, glassy silica, we have here a much diffuser um, fraction pattern, or actually only one peak very well visible, which corresponds to the to the nearest neighbors of the of the particle zero, which um, we, uh, or of, of each particle, let's say, and then this gives us some um, some oscillations in the pair distribution function or um, for very small values of r, and then very soon there will be just basically. A, um, it will be flat or, or noisy. One has to be very careful with computing these pair distribution functions because, as you might imagine, um, it, it's a sum over many, many scattering centers. And the, often there is not one solution. So, as we have to go this way to that we, that we cannot un unravel the, the, the Fourier transformed uh, scattering function from the, from, no, no, the other, the other way around, cannot unravel the, the, the G, the, the correlation function from the scattering function. So we have to model it. 
So we, we need to we need as much a priori information about our sample, especially the more and more disordered our sample becomes, like in like in this case, to get the right pair distribution function here, um, just because there are so many possibilities to model this data. So. Then if we don't average over all energies, which means we have a significant part of neutrons exchange energies and or we are just interested in, in this, um, we, we go to inelastic neutron scattering. There will be, of course, um, later also um, talks about this more in detail, but Actually, we can observe a variety of, of, of different effects here, um, both at, at very different values of, of, of omega also and also in Q. So, so this is, <laughs> here's kind of the, the whole family of, of effects we can, um, we, we can see in the inelastic scattering. So here's a scattering function um, Q of depending on Q and omega, and and we see if um, that this becomes complicated very very fast, since we have to measure for for every Q value. There might be a different um, there might be a different um, well, spectrum in, in, in omega, but this is not the, the whole proof anyway, because as we see here is the elastic peak. Um, so of course, if we have here omega, then the neutron energy might be actually either positive or negative. So we have the, the same thing on the other side again, um, but as we as also um, Elucine and, and Henry also explained before, we have to be careful here that on both sides the intensity will not have exactly uh, a peak that, that is in principle um, present on, on both sides of the elastic peaks um, does not necessarily has the, have the the same intensity, and this is connected to, to this factor, this Poisson factor, reflected, uh, reflecting the population of states. So, if we have uh, an event that occurs at this energy, it will have um, a certain probability that it happens for um, for the for a neutron giving energy to the sample, but the neutron taking energy from the sample requires that, that these states are um, already populated in the sample, which is given by this port, Portsmouth factor here. So depending on, um, on the temperature of the sample, so this beta of course is um, one over kVT, so reflecting the energy at the temperature of the sample. Um, so at high temperatures, this will be more and more symmetric, but at low temperatures, we have to take this into account. And then there is another function, which is, um, which we can observe uh, and which is related to um, the correlation function, also the, the scattering function. Um, it is actually also a correlation function itself, is if we have here the intermediate um, scattering function, and it's called like this because it's somehow in between the, the G and the S. So we tra Fourier transform only um, in space, but not in time. So this T 
some thing we call Fourier time, and we can we can record this function, for example, by neutron spin spectroscopy, um, which gives us also information about the about the dynamics in the sample. So, in this case, this function has not really an advantage about the about the scattering function itself. It's just another a representation in another space, time. Um, so, what we can see here, for example, these are data from so from lipid vesicles, and it's recorded in the Q range, um, corresponding to bending fluctuation in these spherical shells that are about 100 nanometer in size. Um, and we can see the faster this function decays in, in the Fourier time, the faster the vesicle moves, uh, the, the, the faster the structure moves. Um, and we can and we can relate from from this to the to the dynamics in the sample. Um, something like this. Yes. Good. So uh, to summarize, um, we can also. Oh, Correlation functions are very, very important for neutron function, uh, neutron scattering experiments, because they can be calculated from the scattering function coming out of the neutron experiments, and it reflects the, it describes the microscopic structure and the dynamics of the system. Um, they relate to the scattering function by the Fourier transform and can therefore um, be modeled from a theory about our, our sample and then and then be compared to the to the data we collect from from an experiment. However, depending on, on the system's order, the one one has to be careful to, to, to model as much information as possible in advance to in order to avoid any ambiguities in the in the sample um, in the data since the, the inverse Fourier transform has, um, has has the weakness that because since uh, the, the data is an overlap of many, many um, scattering events, um, there might be more than one solution. So um, I want to thank <laughs> you, for, uh, you for your attention and Helmut Chova for this document he gave me. Um, thanks to Hussein and to the organizers and happy birthday Carmen, which is <laughs> today. So everyone can unmute themselves and, and sing happy birthday if you like.